Switch uh, cell phones off, please, if we have any cell phones. Thank you. So let's proceed. I pointed out numerous times over the years, one of the most important and foundational passages in the New Testament to understand the rest of Scripture, something that we have to understand fundamentally, foundationally, to understand the rest of Scripture, is 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Remember, more than two-thirds of the scripture is the Tanakh. It's the Old Testament. And let's look at what St. Paul, Rabbi Shaul of Tarsus, tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He tells us this in verse 6. These things, that is the history of Israel, happened as examples for us, that we should not crave evil things as they crave, or be idolaters, etc., do not make the same mistakes as Israel. Now the Old Testament, the Tanakh, has much meaning for believers and of course an unbelievers for Israel and the Jews. But for the believer, both Jew and Gentile, the primary meaning of more than two-thirds of Scripture is to learn from the mistakes of Israel with an emphasis on not repeating them. There's a reference to this, of course, also in Romans chapter 15. We won't go there now. But Paul reiterates this. Don't make the same mistake as they did. Verse 11. These things happened to them as an example. And they were written for our instruction. Remember, in Romans 11, the church is warned. Primarily non-Jewish Christians are warned. If you didn't spare the natural branches, he won't spare you either. Don't make the same mistakes. It's fundamental. We are to read the Old Testament, the history of Israel, in this light. Now remember, from Abraham, the first Jew, a Gentile who God converted to Judaism, all the way to Jesus, was 2,000 years. The time from Abraham to Jesus was just as long as the time from Jesus to us. God was dealing with Israel and the Jews long before he was dealing with the church. There was no church. But let's go a bit further. If you've never heard me point it out, a distinction must be made between the people of God and the children of God. The people of God and the children of God are not necessarily the same. I live in Great Britain. And in Great Britain, we have a queen, the monarch. The queen, however, is half Scottish, one quarter Hanoverian German. <laughs> oh, and, and, I'm sorry, half Hanoverian German. Her son, Prince Charles, is called the Prince of Wales. He's one quarter Scottish, 
one quarter Hanoverian German and half Greek. He doesn't have a drop of Welsh blood in his veins. He has no Welsh DNA whatsoever. But he's the Prince of Wales. He's not an Anglo-Saxon. He's not even ethnically English. But he's next in line to be the King of England. Now this doesn't make a lot of sense to people who don't live in the British Commonwealth. It only makes sense to people who live in the British Commonwealth. It seems crazy to other people, and I can understand why it seems confused. Well, how can it be that he's the Prince of Wales when he's not Welsh? How can it be that he's next in line to be the British monarch when he's not English? He's German, he's Greek, a little bit Scottish, but he's not an Englishman, and he's certainly not Welsh. Because he is the son. Because he is the son. He's not one of the people, but he's the son. Therefore he reigns. It is Israel and the Jews who are the people of God. Romans 11 makes that clear. They are still the people of God. Believers will co-reign with Christ even if they're not Jewish, because they are sons or daughters. Prince Charles will be the monarch because of birth, not because of ethnicity. Non-Jewish believers in Jesus will co-reign with Christ in the millennium and then into eternity because of second birth, not because of ethnicity. It's always based on birth, from second birth. But they're still the people of God. Now, John 1.12, while well, we can apply it generally, he came to his own, the Jews, his own would not believe, but to the ones who did, to those Jews who believed, he gave the right to become the children of God. You can be one of the people who's also a son. But they're the remnant. There's a remnant of the Gentile nations and there's a remnant of Israel. Two-thirds of the scriptures are written so the church would not make the same mistake. Two-thirds of the scriptures were written so believers would not make the same errors. And we are warned of the ramifications of this very specifically and explicitly in Romans 11 as well as other passages. You think of it. The primary reason two-thirds of the scriptures was written, the prime, not the only, but the primary reason is to learn from Israel. Now Romans 15 takes a slightly more positive view of this, but it says the same thing. With this background in view, we're looking tonight at the broken sister. The broken sister. Turn with me, please, to Jeremiah chapter 2. Yeremiah Hanami. One of the most important and devastatingly accurate, almost shocking, Prophecies in Scripture. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. Who are his people? Israel and the Jews. They've committed two evils. The first evil, they have forsaken me the fountain of living waters. The second evil, to who for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. A number of years ago we did a teaching on John 4, the woman at the well, we explained this a little bit, but look with me please to John chapter 7 to see what Jesus is talking about. In John chapter 7, we have a partial fulfillment, a messianic fulfillment, a partial messianic fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles, Hat Sukkot, Hat Sukkot, the Feast of Booths. And there'll be an ultimate messianic fulfillment of it in Zechariah 14 when the Messiah comes but there was a partial fulfillment in his first coming. Jesus fulfills the spring holy days in a primary sense in his first coming, 
when he fulfills the autumn holy days in his second. There's only a partial fulfillment of the autumn holy days in his first coming, and this is the Feast of Booths. The background is a ceremony called Simcha Bet Hashoiva. Simcha Bet Hashoiva, a festival of joy. It's well excavated now. Approximately 80% of the original pool of Siloam, Shaloam, same word in Hebrew for apostle, one of the set. It's 80% excavated. But more impressively, right next to it, excavated now is the stairway going from the pool of Siloam at the lower end, the southern end of the city of David, by the refuse gate or the dun gate, whatever they want to call it, up the Temple Mount, a big long stairway where the procession would take place. The Levites would take containers of water and they would fill the containers of water and they would sing psalms of ascent. Whenever you go up to the temple, you always sing a psalm of ascent. They're easy to identify even in English. Whenever you go to Jerusalem, you never Go down even if you're coming from the north. You always say go up, la alot, like El Al Airlines. All of you would be familiar with some of the Psalms of Ascent. I rejoice when they said to me, let us go up to the house of the Lord going up. Let's go up to Zion, let's go up to Zion. Na Alexiona, na Alexiona, na Alexiona, Kiriat Melekrav, Shir Hallelujah. Beautiful. Well, my voice isn't in the song to do. <laughs> so, they have this procession, and they're singing these songs of ascent and joy. And they're bringing water, mine hiding, living water, water that's drinkable, not stacked with it. And this big procession up the stairway, it's excavated. You can go to it now, photograph it. Up you go. And on the Temple Mount, they pour out on the Gavata, they go through Solomon's portico, and they pour out the water. This is the Simcha Bet HaShoiva. It's described extensively in Josephus Antiquities and also in the Mishnah, but it exactly what's in the history and in the archaeology confirms the historicity of the New Testament. Liberal theologians don't like archaeology in history because it proves the Bible is true. <laughs> So they go up and they pour the water out. And it's against this background, the Lord Jesus says, on the last day, the great day of the feast, it's seven days the Feast of Tabernacles. This is the last day, it's Simcha Bet He stood out and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Now here he's drawing in large part on the millennial imagery of Ezekiel chapter 47. I only mention that in passing. Remember, Feast of Tabernacles is a future prophetic reading in Ezekiel and in Zechariah and in Revelation. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, referring or alluding to Ezekiel 47, from his innermost beings will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. This was Hak Sukkot. It was not Hak Shavuot. It was not Pentecost. So the mind Hayim is the Holy Spirit. He tells the woman at the woman in John 4, I'll give you my Hayim. I'll give you living water. I'll give you the Holy Spirit. Now this is the last day of the feast. The next day is something called Simcha Torah. Simcha Torah, the joy of the Torah, when they dance with the scrolls. We have a teaching on the internet called Simcha Torah, and I explain how Jesus fulfills Simcha Torah in John 8. Nonetheless, let's go back now to Jeremiah. Chapter 2. The first evil. The 
that his people would commit, they would forsake him, the fountain of living water. They would reject the Messiah, the one who gives the Holy Spirit. They would forsake him. They'd reject Yeshua. They'd reject Jesus as the Mashiach, as the Messiah. That's the first. That's the first evil. But then there's a second evil. To who for themselves? Cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. They would invent a spiritually bankrupt false religion. They would invent a counterfeit Judaism that was devoid of the Ruach HaKodesh, that did not have the Holy Spirit. It was a broken cistern, as it were, a bucket with holes in it. It couldn't hold water. It was a water container that was cracked. It was perforated. It was useless. It could not have the Holy Spirit in it. Last Sunday, after I got back in the Far East, I was in London. I lived near London, England. I was speaking at Woodbury Downs Baptist Church, which was right next to a neighborhood called Stamford Hill. Stamford Hill is the borough park of London, it's where the Hasidim live. And they're all over the place. One Hasidic neighborhood, it doesn't matter if it's the one in Antwerp, Belgium, or Meir Sharim in Jerusalem, or B'nai Brack in Tel Aviv, or Borough Park, or Williamsburg, it doesn't matter which one, they all look the same. They all look the same. They all dress the same. They all look the same. Their mind is in a shtetl, a Jewish ghetto. They don't look back to the scriptures as the ideal. They look back to the, like Fiddler on the Roof type stuff. When, when the cop or the shoemaker studied Torah, that's their ideal what Judaism should be. And so they came to Israel, and they still, even in their own land, they live as if they lived in a shtetl. You know, the way they look upon Gentiles in the diaspora, that's the way they look upon secular Jews in Israel. <laughs> the non-religious Jews become the boys to them. They live in a shtetl. It's their mom. Now that's the extreme example of, of Orthodox Judaism. But it's spiritually bankrupt. Yet, because it is ostensibly based on Torah, ostensibly, it has some truth in it. This becomes the problem. It looks like a good bucket, but there's holes in it. So his people would commit two evils. They'd reject the Messiah, the one who could give the Holy Spirit, but then they'd do a second evil. They would invent another religion which was an abomination. Echavod, Ichabod. I pointed out many times the problem with unsaved Jews, with unbelieving Jews, is not that they reject Yeshua. If you don't know, that is not the problem, that is the result of the problem. That is the tragic consequence of the problem. Here's their real problem. John chapter 5. Verse 45. Do not think I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, in whom you've set your hope. If you believed Moses, you'd believe me. He wrote of me. But if you don't believe the Torah, his writings, how are you going to believe my words? The problem with unsaved Jews, particularly religious Jews, is not that they reject Yeshua. The problem is they don't believe Moses. The problem is they don't believe the Torah. If they really believed the Torah, if they really believed the law, they would know he's the Messiah. But they don't believe the law and the prophets. That's why they reject the Messiah. So they have this broken sister. 
This broken system is falsely called Judaism. But it is not Judaism, it is Rabbinism. It is not Mosaic, it is Rabbinic. Okay. It is not Levitical, it is Talmudic. It is not the Judaism of Moses and the prophets. It is a man-made religion. I have a teaching on our website called The Tale of Two Rabbis. And I explain about St. Paul's classmate, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai, from the school of Hillel, with Rabbi Gamaliel, and Ankrios and those other guys, and how Yochanan ben Zakai began what is today Judaism, and how it evolved over a period of centuries, but it's not Judaism. Levitical Judaism, the Judaism of the Torah, has not existed since 70 A.D. Daniel chapter 9. Mashiach keeps the neck of all, but I'm not even a horrible man. I went on to the Lubavitcher website, and you wouldn't believe they were just lying. This Lubavitch rabbi was just lying to people. To, to try to circumvent what Daniel 9 says. He was actually, I would have loved to debate that guy publicly. I debated another rabbi on the street, on front of the synagogue up by Lincoln Center a number of years ago. That's quite a number of years ago. And I debated him right on the street. He, he was a well-known rabbi on the Upper West Side. And he got so angry, he said, give me a better source than Daniel. By which he meant rabbinic tradition. <laughs> what they believe is the prophets were simply messengers. The rabbis are the gaonim, the sages, the geniuses who have to interpret the message. It actually says in the Talmud, the opinion of a thousand and one rabbis outweighs the opinion of a thousand prophets. It's a broken system. It's a false truth. It is a kavod, a kavod, the glory is being called. That's what happened. The temple was gone. Fulfillment of Daniel chapter 9. They had a council of a place called Yahweh near modern Tel Aviv. And they said, well, instead of the temple, we're going to have a synagogue. Instead of the Levites, we're going to have a rabbi. Instead of that creed, instead of the sacrifices, we're going to have these mitzvot. <laughs> you read the Torah, there's no rabbi, there's no synagogue. And most of the mitzvot are not in there. There's 613 commandments, most of which they can't keep anyway. So they invent a broken system. When you reject true Judaism, you have to invent a false one. When you reject the true Messiah, you will follow a false one. And his people have done that for centuries. They did it with Bar Kokhba in the second century. They did it with Jacob Frank. They did it with Shabbat High Speed. In our lifetime, they were doing it with Menachem Shearson from Brooklyn. Posters all over Israel with his picture, Melech Mashiach, King Messiah. It's for sugar. A proven false prophet. When you reject the true Messiah, you gotta find a false one. But the worst is yet to come. Jesus said, I come in my own name, you don't believe. But if another comes in his own name, him you will believe. The Antichrist is going to sell them a bill of goods. The stage is being set for it as we speak, the covenant with death. All they've got is a broken cistern that can hold no water. Do me a favor. If that's what you want to believe, that's what you
you want to teach in the yeshivas, and that's what you, that, that's what you think that your, your beliefs are, okay, but find another name for it. Please don't call it Judaism. It's not Judaism. It's Rabbinism. Find another name for it. Stop calling it Judaism. It's not Judaism. And that's not to say there is no valid Judaism today. How many Jewish believers in Jesus do we have here today? Put your hand up. Look around. Yeah. That's valid Judaism. That's real Judaism. They are both the natural branches of the church and the faithful remnant of Israel for this time in history. What the 7,000 who didn't bow the knee to Baal were for them, these brothers here, these sisters, that's what they are for now. They're both the faithful remnant of Israel and the natural branches of the church. That's real Judaism, the Messianic Jews. As Paul says, we establish the Torah. The rabbis reject them. They have something called Hemish. They teach little kids Hemish. They use the Torah as a book to teach little kids to read Hebrew. That's what it is. They'll see Jane run, see Spot. That's, what, that's how they use the Torah, to teach little kids how to read. Then they get down to the serious stuff when you get older. Rashi said this and Rambam said that. <laughs> And all becomes rabbinic, all Talmudic, much of it contradictory, a broken system. When you reject the real system, you get a false one. When you reject the true Messiah, you get a false one. And again, the worst, prophetically, is yet to come. It's on the horizon. It's easy, it's easy to point the finger at Israel and the Jews and say, find another name for your broken system. Who can be out of the discourse? Matthew 24. Verse 23, if anyone says to you, behold, here's the Messiah, here's the Christ, or <clears throat> well, there he is, don't believe him. False Christ and false prophets will arise. If they say he's in the wilderness, don't go there. If they say he's in the inner rooms, keep away from there. Don't go there. I'm not returning physically except at the parousia, the way I left. Don't believe anybody who says, I come back physically. How many ex captains we have here? Former Roman tech, look around. When there's a mass, they say he's come back under the appearances of bread and wine, transubstantiated as the so called blessed sacrament. They literally worship it as Christ incarnate. Open idolatry. Then in a fundamental rejection of the true gospel, which says he dies once and for all, six times in Hebrew and once in Peter, they say he continues to die sacramentally. And then in an act of cannibalism, they eat what they say is his flesh and blood, they drink it. A vampire ritual called the Mass. Now if it was his real blood, and they completely twist John 6 out of all context. Why are you drinking it? The apostle said, don't do that in Acts 15. Don't consume blood. Why are you doing the Dracula thing? You reject the true Jesus. You get a false one. Do me a favor. Don't call it Christianity. Call it the pontifical religions of pagan Rome in Christian masquerade, but don't call it Christianity.
humanity. Talmudic Judaism is not Judaism. Roman Catholicism is not Christianity. Either is the Eastern Orthodox Church. You pray through an icon that has a metaphysical power and you communicate with God and enter the spiritual realm through a great image. Theosis, they call it. This is mysticism. If that's what you want to believe, you can believe that. But find another name for your broken sister. Please do not call it Christianity. <coughs> it's people have committed two evils. But so have those who profess to be his sons. To make matters worse, liberal Protestantism, the World Council of Churches, is even worse than Roman Catholicism. At least a Roman Catholic, if they're a devout Catholic, will profess to believe in a literal virgin birth and a literal resurrection. Protestantism became something, by and large, worse than what it set out to reform. Find another name for it. Find another name. Please don't call mainstream Protestantism Christianity. Got another Jesus. Got a broken system. The Spirit of God is not in us. Are you saying that there's not true believers in those churches? What I say is not important. It's what the Lord Jesus says that's important. What I say is meaningless. What does he say in Revelation 18, verse 4? I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins or receive of her praise. Yeah, there may be people in it who do believe, who are regenerate, who are saved. But because they are his people, he commands them. Doesn't encourage them or urge them. He commands them, get out of it. You cannot remain in a false religious system without sinning. Every time a Roman Catholic genuflects before a graven image and prays to the dead, they've committed the sin of necromancy. Every time they eat the Catholic Eucharist, they commit the sin of idolatry and cannibalism. You cannot be in it without participating in the sins and sharing in the plagues. Come out of her, my people. Now I know people who were saved in dodgy Protestant churches and in the Roman church and so forth. But the Holy Spirit showed them through reading the scriptures, get out of it. What I say doesn't matter. It's what Jesus says that matters. Find another name for your perforated Buckets. It's devoid of the spirit of God. Find another name for it. You've rejected the fountain of living water. You've rejected the true Jesus. You've come up with another one. Jehovah's Witnesses have a different Jesus. They say he's an angel. The Mormons have a different Jesus. They say he's the spirit brother of Satan. New Ages, they have a different Jesus, but the cosmic Christ. Roman Catholicism, 
Jerusalem has a different Jesus, the Eucharistic Christ. They all got a different Christ. Remember, they come in his name. As I always put it, two guys named Robert Jones and the Manhattan Telephone Director. Does that mean they're the same guy? Unbelievable. The broken system. When I was first saved, and in the years after that, things were pretty cut and dry. There was an analogy that some people made to Israel and Judah in Israel's history. Judah often was faithful when they had good kings, like Hezekiah or Asa. But Israel was always backslidden, with the partial exception of the reign of Jehu. It was always backslidden. So you had evangelical churches and denominations, born-again believers, you had Baptists and Pentecostals and Mennonites and Plymouth Brethren. You had people who were regenerate, who were saved, who were born again, who were quote unquote evangelical with Christian Missionary Alliance and things like this. That was one church. And the people in that church generally all knew Rome was the false church. Or the liberal Protestants, the World Council of Churches, were the false church. People knew that. Now some of these evangelical churches were better than others, but they all knew basic truth. I remember it was a common Christian colloquialism among believers, even here in my native New York City. where we would refer to the Roman church or the liberal churches and things like this as Babylon. Babylon was the cult like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and Rome and the World Council of the Churches and the Eastern Orthodox. That was Babylon. We were the same ones. Fast forward. 40 years later. <laughs> Remember what God told Judah in the days of Jeremiah? What God told Judah in the days of Ezekiel? You're worse than your sister. You're worse than Israel before the Babylonian captivity. You're worse. You're worse. I can no longer say Babylon is mainstream Protestantism or Rome or the cults. It's not that simple anymore. What do you do when you have a hillside? I just got back from Sydney, Australia, I spoke in Sydney a few weeks ago. You wouldn't believe those songs. The financial and sexual scandals in that place are unbelievable. And people still go to it. But in this city, after Carl Lynn refused on CNN to say same-sex marriage was wrong, they had the women's conference. In this city, a couple of thousand Christian women. And a guy comes out as Jesus dressed as the Statue of Liberty in female drag, instead of the crown of thorns, the crown of the Statue of Liberty. And they begin singing the Frank Sinatra song, New York, New York. And they said this was worship. Then they bring out the youth minister, dressed as or undressed as the naked cowboy. This guy standing there with cowboy boots, a 10 gallon cowboy out of the guitar. And all these Christian 
two of them are clapping and cheering and saying hallelujah, whatever they were saying. It's on YouTube. And of course the media gets a hold of it. You're worse than your sister is. I know Roman Catholics who aren't that nuts. I mean, I know ones who are, but I know plenty who aren't. We're talking evangelism. The word faith money preaches. The worship of mammon. Faith in faith instead of faith in Jesus. Calling the sin of covetousness Faith, please find another name for your broken sister. Don't call it Christianity. Find another name for it. They rejected the real Jesus. Instead, they got the Statue of Liberty mimicking Jesus, and they got the naked cowboy. They lost their mind. A broken system that can hold no water. The debauchery that people will go into when they reject the truth can be historically astounding. Although my background was in science, I left all that and I went into studying Judaism and theology in order to evangelize Jewish people in, at Cambridge University in England. Big deal, doesn't mean anything, but I, that's why I studied it. Went there. And I learned a lot of things. Perversion of the truth. He who knew no sin became sin. Jesus had no sin, but he took ours in order to bring us redemption. But when you reject the real Messiah who did that, you've got to do it for yourself. This is what really happened. Orthodox Jews in the 1700s went to the public squares in Poland and Lithuania, stripped naked and had public sex orgies in front of the Gentiles because the rabbis told them, we have to know the depths of sin before we can experience redemption. That's what they did in the days of Jacob Frank. How sick can this be? My people have committed to evils. So have the sons and daughters. They've rejected the fountain to who for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. They've invented a different religion. You can call it Judaism, but it's not Judaism. You can call it Christianity, but it's not Christianity. You can call it evangelicism, but it's not evangelical. It's sick and depraved. Find another name for it. You got a broken system. Doesn't matter how much they try. You can replace worship with entertainment. You can turn the music ministry into the music industry. You can replace anointing with hype. You can replace exposition of God's word with motivational speaking. You can do all that. But you can't put water into a broken system any more than you can eat soup with a fork. It just doesn't work. Two things. 
I pointed this out many times. I really don't like to say good things about the devil, but he certainly knows his business. If he deceived the Jews like this, he can deceive the church. He shouldn't be able to. Paul says, don't let this happen to you. Look at what Israel did. But not the They've got a broken system. A broken system. I travel a lot. In New Zealand, Australia, recently in England, America now. I have to go to Argentina next week, but right now in the English speaking world mostly, it's all the same. Fewer and fewer saved Christians even know basic doctrine. Fewer and fewer saved Christians even know basic doctrine anymore. Now there are still some churches that teach good basic doctrine. You can go to Calvary Baptist on 57, which great Pastor Epstein's decent preacher. I'm not saying it's not around anywhere. But even basic, basic evangelical doctrine has become a rare commodity. I'm not talking about the deeper stuff. I'm not talking about typology or midrash or eschatology. I'm talking about the fundamentals. People don't know. They don't have the milk, let alone the meat. My people perish for lack of knowledge. Jeremiah said. No. What God says to his people in the Diamond District on 47th Street, Manhattan. Those rooms running around with the payout. And the women with the shtables, they have one baby after another. It's a mitzvah. Because they think one might be the Messiah to Messiah. You see, when you reject the real Messiah, you get neurotic about stuff. We want Mashiach now. That's what they say, we want Messiah now. That's their theme. Mashiach, Mashiach, Mashiach. You used to see them in Israel, they go bananas. You've rejected the Mashiach. They're being set up for the Antichrist. Daniel spoke of this directly. The prophet Daniel said this to make a covenant with death. If Jesus doesn't come back and save their skin, none of them would survive. That's his people. In the days of Jeremiah, they went into Babylon. In our day, the mainstream evangelical church is going into Babylon. Babylon the Greats. Old Testament Babylon, the Babylonian Empire, is a shadow, a type of the Babylon the Great in Revelation. It goes back to the Tower of Babel of Nimrod and Semiramis, but the Old Testament captivity of Babylon. Is a picture of what happens. For all of his later faults, Luther realized this in the Middle Ages. He wrote a treatise called The Babylonian Empire, the Babylonian Captivity of the Church. I'm not saying something new that believers haven't known before. But we're at a very, very low ebb. A serious low ebb. We're going to Babylon. What happened to Israel when they did this? They went to Babylon. What's going to happen when Brian Houston, who pretended as pedophile father, says that Muslims have the same God as Christians? They're going to go to Babylon. They have something called Chrislam now, if you believe me. A 
I've been to Saudi Arabia. Don't tell me that Christianity is compatible with Islam. I've seen real Islam. You see, that's the complication. You don't see real Islam in the United States. You have to go to a Muslim country to see it. You don't see real Roman Catholicism. You want to see real Roman Catholicism, you have to go like to Ireland or Poland or somewhere like that. Or Latin America. When you see it in its own cultural element, you see how different it is. Here these things are all to some degree Americanized. Quite a thing. Quite a thing to do. Find another name for it. Don't call it Judaism. Find another name for your perforated bucket, your broken system. The Spirit of God is not in it. Find another name for your church. For your denomination, for your naked cowboy Statue of Liberty religion, find another name for it. Got that crazy guy in California, Bill Johnson, a complete mystic. The New Apostolic Reformation, crazy. The emergent church, they're going to medieval monasticism as a guide to spirituality. Lectio Divina contemplated prayer labyrinths. This stuff is a pagan mystical origin. Isaiah chapter 2, my people are filled with influences from the East. Same as the Jews. Where did the rabbis get Kabbalah? Babylon. It's Babylonian Gnosticism put into Jewish terminology. That's all it is. With the Demiurges, Say God is the iron soul and he only has emanations, no essence. He's, people don't even know what these people believe. Hasidic Jews are capitalists. They believe God has lost his identity. And by capturing something called Zumzums, holy sparks, observant Jews can help him get it back. We've got to capture the Zumzums by keeping the mitzvot. When you see them dominating and all this stuff, it's just, they're trying to capture the Zoom Zooms so God can get his identity back. They believe he has no essence. He's the iron soul. He only has attributes. This is pure Gnosticism. But the Demiurges are not, they teach the same thing. I always remember when we have pastors from India came to England, saved out of Hinduism and the Sikh religion, and we showed them the videos of the counterfeit laughing and drunken revivals in Toronto and Pensacola, and they said, this is Kundalini Yoga. They knew exactly what it was! Find another name for your broken bucket. Please don't call it Christianity. Well, as it was, so it is. And as it is, it's going to be. New York City is the biggest Jewish population center in the world. More Jews in Greater New York than in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. Welcome. Once again, how many Jews we have here? Put your hands on. Jews here. Okay. There's a remnant. He came to his own, his own would not believe, but to those Jews who believed, he gave the right to be the children of God. They're like twice chosen. They're both the people and the children. They're the natural branches. It's only a remnant. Will Son of Man find faith on earth? He's going to find a remnant of Italians. 
He's going to find a remnant of Koreans. He's going to find a remnant of Chinese. He's going to find a remnant of Afro-Caribbeans. He's going to find a remnant of Irish. He's going to find a remnant of Latin Americans. He's going to find what he found the first time. Popular rejection, but a faithful remnant. If you are here tonight, understand the grace and favor of God he's given you if you bear witness with the truth. Don't take my word for it. You test everything I say, prayerfully and carefully. But understand the privilege God has given you and the calling. Most don't believe. Not only do most Jews not believe in their own Messiah, most Christians, quote unquote, don't believe in him. And now fewer and fewer evangelical Christians really believe in him. They find another one. It is they won't talk about sin or judgment or anything like that or the need for repentance. They gotta get their own Jesus. And because he's gonna be a nice guy, goes to good with everything. He was good with everything. He wouldn't have had to die in our place, would he? If he was good with everything, he wouldn't have had to go to the cross in my place or your place. He's not good with everything. They gotta be for Jesus. Now evangelicism is rejecting the fountain of living water. To who for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Most denominations are going to hell in a handbasket. The new apostolic reformation is an abomination. And it's getting worse. They're bound one place. Just as in the days of Yermiyahu Hanabi and the days of Jeremiah the prophet, they are bound for one place. And that place is Babylon. By his grace, and only by his grace, those who remain in the truth are not bound to them. They are bound for glory. It was ugly when Judah became as bad as Israel. And it actually became worse. It is ugly when Protestantism became as bad as Catholicism and then became worse. And now evangelicism? Good Lord Almighty have mercy. They got a broken system. This joint might not be much. It's an old, rusty bucket. I was just in Vietnam with the persecuted church talking to their pastors. I asked them, how many of you brothers have been in prison for your faith?
when the Lord comes back, it won't be like that. Right now, even if the bucket is rusty, I'd rather carry it because that's the one that's got the water in it. The mind behind it. The Ruach HaKodesh. The Spirit of Jesus. God bless and thank you for listening. Dave, we have a break for how long? 